and thank you for having me. You know, it's been a couple of years that I've been trying to make it to Stanford. Um, and I haven't been able to travel for a variety of reasons easily. And here we are with a uh, pandemic making a virtual visit possible. So I'm really excited to be here and I'm hoping the network will be more reliable for the rest of the hour. I haven't had these kinds of troubles before, but of course they pick their time. <laughs> um, so let me pull up my slides. So um, thank you. I, I did hear you mention the newly founded Create Center, and I actually want to highlight one other center, which is DFAB, the Digital Fabrication Center at UW, which I am also part of, although not directing. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to talk today about is actually featuring things that happened through DFAB, um, because I'm, I decided to um, focus today's talk or guide it based on the work that I spent the spring doing in reaction to the arrival of COVID-19. So what you see on this slide is actually a picture of a whole pile of face shields that I spent one night, um, many of us assembled, but I, in particular, this pile was one that I spent a long night assembling so that we could deliver them to the local hospital. Um, and the team that I was part of actually um, was a very large team. I'll introduce it in a second, but these, this is the set of things that we worked on over the spring, face shields, isolation gowns, um, clips that would hold tubes together, eye protection, um, head, and shoe covers, surgical masks, non-rebreather masks, vacuum face tents, N95s, PAPRs, and um, CAPR repairs. So it was a really wide ranging effort. Um, and I'm just gonna focus on a few of these, but just to give you a sense also of the team, um, it involved uh, physicians, um, someone from the VA who led, um, actually ended up winning an award for her work in doing safety testing on this front, um, a whole pile of engineers, both from UW and beyond, if you see Scott Hudson in there, um, and various other people as well. And, and many students and faculty who are not pictured on that slide were part of this effort. And what we did um, was, um, I, the timeline's coming in a second, but right at the start of the pandemic, this team came together and um, the face shields that you see here were actually designed by Tim Prestero, who's part of design.thatmatters.org, but then they were modified from Prusa's design specifically to add the uh, visor that helped stop drops from coming into the face. And this is probably the most well-known design that was 3D printed worldwide. Um, many varieties of this kind of design were printed by designers all over the place. Um, the version that Tim worked on was actually submitted to the FDA or actually the NIH 3D Print Exchange on 331 and was clini uh, reached clinical approval, meaning it was safe to use in hospitals within about two weeks of that date. And um, the UW side of this was primarily documentation, quality assurance, um, and production. And we delivered about a thousand of these in Seattle. Um, and by the way, if you haven't heard about how these were made, one of the fun things about it was that we went all over campus collecting transparencies of the type that I used to give talks with in the 90s when I was a grad student, which had been sitting in drawers all over campus for a really long time. And that's what makes up the shield part of these, um, along with a three hole punch they are prepared to, to clip onto the face shield. Um, another thing that we went pretty far with was these kinds of gowns. Um, this was submitted to NIH in late April, but it's still not approved. And that's one of the many things that I'm gonna hopefully talk about a little bit today, despite the fact that garbage bags are still being used in some places where gowns are in short supply. Um, and I'm gonna hope that somebody will tell me if there's an er interruption. Please do feel free to tell me if there are questions. Um, I'm having trouble seeing both your faces and my slides, so I'm feeling a little cut off, but that's okay. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll unmute your, ourselves if there's a question. Excellent. Um, so another area that I was pretty closely involved in and that we did a lot of work in had to do with masks. And masks is a really diverse thing. Um, the thing that we worked the hardest on was actually what you might call fit to face, uh, because for many mask applications, it's really important that air not escape around the edges of the mask. So it has to fit your face really well. Um, and given a mask that has good fit to face, you can attach all sorts of things to it. You can attach, dif attach different kinds of filters. You can use it as a non-rebreather. There's lots of things you can do with it. And so that kind of, this tree just shows some of the things that we played around with in the mask space. 
Um, and we did get clinical approval for a surgical mask, which is less um, protective than an N95 mask. It's the kind of thing that people wear around when they have paper masks on. Those are surgical masks. The N95s are sometimes also, um, you see them on consumers' faces, um, but they are have a tighter fit to face and a different filter material. Um, and we also got to the point where we were doing testing in the field for an, an, an N95 replacement and a large scale, youth, um, large scale meaning produced at scale non-rebreather. Um, I just wanted to highlight this one last one because although um, it wasn't a focus of the work I was part of, um, it's one of the few that has a label built into it. And we'll talk a little bit later about why labeling is so important. Um, and so what you can see here is that um, actually when this is 3D printed, it's just got a hole where the label is. And that label is important because what the two tubes that you attach with this particular clip are specified by the label and different tubes have different diameters and different clips are needed. Um, in terms of timeline, this all started March 21st um, with a, an email um, and by Monday we were approved to go on campus and we collected 3D printers from all over UW's campus and put them in the mechanical engineering building and within about a week we had a team running the printers 24-7 to produce face masks um, and a bunch of other things going on as well. Um, within two weeks, we had the clinical approval of the face shields. I shouldn't say FDA approval because those are different. Um, in April, we started on the gown designs and submitted those in late April. Um, by May, we had delivered all of the masks that we were going to deliver. We were approved to also supply them to some of the on-campus workers who were um, still being exposed regularly, as well as UW hospitals, but were never approved to deploy them more broadly than that. And I'll talk about that too a little bit. Um, we did a lot of documentation work, hoping that others would be able to produce those things. And we have that up on the DFAB website. Um, and then um, we began to close things down in June. Um, okay, um, although I'm focusing on our work with COVID, I do wanna say that this talk is informed by a series of ethnographic and interview studies that have been done since 2016 primarily with Megan Hoffman and Scott Hudson. And Megan is my PhD student. He'll be graduating in just over a year, hint, hint. <laughs> and has been very strongly involved in a bunch of this work. Um, so it started with a sort of um, process of us designing things for upper limb prosthetic users, where we were the designers and 3D printers and everything else. We did similar work with clinicians in their clinics in 2016, um, sorry, in 2019 with occupational therapists. And in between, we did um, uh, interviews and other things with Enable volunteers. And Enable is this national, actually international organization of people who are 3D printing, not exactly prosthetic hands for kids. Um, and there's a lot of questions about how well that goes. Um, and actually just this year, we submitted a, a Kai paper, Safe Savage and I, where we talked to people all over the world who were printing Enable hands, because there's a lot of things that are like really cool looking, superhero themed, get into the media, and then nobody really knows what happens after that, but it doesn't seem like they're lasting very long as success cases. And assistive technology, of course, has a very high abandonment rate, and there are potentially negative consequences there. Um, Interestingly, um, in Latin American organizations that we interviewed where the barriers between clinical work and maker work are, seem to be lower and the collaboration seem to be stronger, we see a very different outcome. Um, and some of that kind of um, barrier lowering really happened in the COVID case as well. So anyway, um, in addition, we've done interviews with a bunch of people who are embedded in the medical system in the US who make um, and, and, and just uh, this whole suite of things with different stakeholders taken together, I think is a really informative way to approach how do we do this and how do we do it right. So the rest of this talk is gonna focus on challenges that came out of and are illustrated by our COVID work, but are also informed by that body of work that I just showed you. And the first challenge that I wanna talk about is um, quality assurance um, or quality control. And what you're seeing here is images from the documentation page that um, Aidan Fay, who is a Stanford alum, you may remember him from his time there, um, helped put together. Um, and he helped us um, try to show people how to tell what was um, properly 3D printed in the face um, shield domain. So this is where the transparency would be attached. 
um, because we were having a huge error rate, um, uh, not a majority, but probably between a third and half of the things that people would deliver um, needed to be thrown out um, because it has to be printed at high quality to be safe. Um, oops. And we actually developed based um, in part on work that Megan did with a, an organization in Colorado called Make for COVID, we developed a QA sheet and I'm showing an excerpt from it in black here at the top that has to be attached to every bag that's delivered to the hospital with these things checked off that bend tests, smoothing, labeling, cleaning, um, and so on were done um, so that they can be confident that what they're giving the workers who are going into these unsafe situations is properly produced. Um, and in all of the hospitals that we worked with on the UW end, safety really came before quantity or even access to uh, PPE, personal protective gear. Um, and so they would rather reuse things that they knew were safe, even if that was not ideal, than have us deliver things they could not count on. Um, interestingly, Make for COVID, the organization that Megan worked with in Colorado, delivered about 80,000 of these face masks and other PPE in comparison to the thousand that we successfully delivered in Seattle. Just want to take a moment to think about the magnitude of difference there. Make for COVID was almost entirely makers and other volunteers and they were such a large organization that they actually had pilots bringing things to parts of Colorado that they couldn't drive too quickly. Um, they, the group involved academics, um, as well as makers in general, and they ended up collaborating really effectively. They generated a ton of documentation and they were um, able to produce at a scale that we never reached at UW. Um, both had problems with quality assurance, but Make for COVID had a different structure for how the volunteers could collaborate and a different level of trust. We never achieved that level of trust with the makers in the Seattle area that the academics and others who were um, hosting Make for COVID achieved in Colorado. Um, and we have a, a in submission paper talking about some of those differences. Um, going back to quality assurance for a second, just showing here sort of the, the way in which, um, so this bucket here is full of wipes that needed to be used, obviously uh, masks and gloves. And here are some of the garbage bags with the QA sheets attached that we then delivered to the UW hospitals. Um, I want to focus on labeling for a second. This was actually not a problem we solved. Um, it turns out that because there are so many varieties being produced, and in at least the Seattle area, there were people producing face shields who weren't necessarily certified as in part of the UW system and known to be using proper methods. Hospitals needed a way to keep track of where things came from so they could reject stuff that wasn't trustworthy. And it ended up being these garbage bags that were that process for UW area hospitals that we worked with because there was no good way to label these face shields, especially once they were cleaned. If they were, they were meant to be used, reused, and the wipes that were cleaning them could actually wipe away even permanent ink. Um, anything that we did that was embedded or cut out potentially would be hard to clean properly because it created little bumps and, and negative spaces that um, were harder to wipe down. So that was not a problem we solved easily. Um, and these kinds of variations like this one at the top that doesn't have the visor were not considered acceptable, at least by the UW hospital because of the risk of droplets coming over the top. So there were just a lot of variations floating around that needed to be controlled. Um, I also wanna mention, um, and this is coming from our prior work. So this is a workshop we did in 2016 with the Enable folks and clinicians that um, one of the things that we saw being problematic was what you might call a conflict between community values and clinical values. And this is something that was overcome much more easily for whatever reason in Colorado than in Seattle with make for, making for COVID. But um, in the Enable cases, for example, it hasn't really been overcome in the US, but in Latin American sites that we studied, it had been. Um, so the difference here of help where you can versus do no harm is surprisingly strong. So for a maker, help where you can is kind of a core value that we found in many of the interviews we've done. For a medical professional, they literally swear an oath when they graduate to do no harm. And um, it turns out that um, this can actually create deep-rooted conflicts. We actually had a team member who was threatened when she raised the question of safety and quality assurance in a social network setting where makers were gathering, not from Colorado, 
but um, in another site. So there was the, the, somebody threatened to ship her COVID infected masks that she should put on her face just because she brought up quality assurance. <laughs> so um, people felt really threatened by the idea that um, their wish to help would be reined in, it seems. <laughs> Um, and the trust between clinicians and makers was not always strong. Um, and these kinds of rifts affected the quantity of things that could be produced and the quality of things that were being produced and I think are very concerning. Um, it's really hard to unpack them. There are structural issues, there are cultural issues, there's a lot of different things going on that can lead to an outcome like this. Um, another difference between clinical work and make, maker work is the focus on longitudinal support and whole case management. Um, a lot of the groups that we have interviewed over the years who are not on the clinical side don't see their responsibility as necessarily extending beyond the delivery of something or the, the making of something cool. Um, and to successfully produce technology that is solving medical problems it's especially assistive technologies, but I would say even PPE, right? There needs to be some sense of longitudinal follow-up. Um, we don't have as much data on that in the PPE space because things have been happening so quickly with COVID, but certainly in the assistive technology space, abandonment's really high. And again, there are these risks. Um, if somebody abandons, they then won't go back and use technology that they need that they might be able to get from a more reliable source. Um, and it just increases the chance that something will not be used. Um, so this is a, a space that needs attention. Um, okay, that's enough for challenge one, number one. Challenge number two is the design process. How do you collaborate across a distance? Um, we had teams located in homes and labs in Pittsburgh, in California, in Washington, Seattle, um, and then testing that had to be done in hospitals, which we did in Seattle, that were being done in clinics, that were being done in some cases by the NIH in a different part of the country. Um, and all of these groups had to collaborate effectively. And we had to collaborate on issues like whether or not something fit a face that really required some level of in-person understanding. Um, so this was a really challenging aspect of what we did, and particularly with COVID, where there are people who literally, even in the same city, couldn't enter the same space with each other and feel comfortable. Um, it came up quite significantly. Um, um, the, another challenge for the design process was, was the fit to face challenge. It wasn't just challenging because of distance, it was a very challenging thing to accomplish, period. Um, the everyday tools that we were using simply didn't model the face well enough to test fit in a virtual simulated context. So we had issues with um, you know, um, being able to clearly specify what was hard and what was soft being able to tell when things intersected. It just, it wasn't feasible to do a good job of this here. We also ended up prototyping using a variety of materials and it was hard to take this back into the modeling system. So here you can see um, there is a, a paper cup that we've cut fingers into um, and wrapped some, some elastic around and that has a plastic liner inside it and together that ended up creating a really good fit. Um, you can see that we did take this back into our designs here. Um, this is um, a student, Sumya Jindal, who is um, actually putting wire through this to help. And there's some rubber on the inside to help make that fit to face happen. Um, and that, that fit to face is particularly necessary to replace N95 masks, which was obviously a, a huge issue over the last few months. Um, tools really make a difference. So here we happen to have a group that was doing simulation of fabric and we were able to make much faster progress on developing gowns um, because of those simulations. Although there were still a lot of factors that were not effectively captured. So here, for example, Danielle Revier is reaching out because the seam construction under the arm, which was done with heat sealing, actually with soldering irons at first, was not necessarily um, strong enough to handle that kind of reaching. And that was something we had to test because it couldn't just come apart unexpectedly. Um, another thing that ended up being a challenge for our design process was shifting technologies as we went from um, initial solutions to scalable solutions. Um, it was really key that we were able to repeatedly produce the same thing over and over again, um, have quality assurance processes that were trustworthy, and it turns out the supply chain for what materials we could get was also really key in deciding what could be scaled. And the supply chains were a little bit unpredictable with COVID. And so we had to design to them to some degree. Um, 
we considered 3D printing, of course, but we also looked at molds and vacuum forming. Um, and of course, you can't think of these in, in a, a vacuum, so to speak, right? So this vacuum formed um, design at right is good as far as it goes, but the time it takes to cut it out and then assemble other pieces to it could potentially impact its viability. Um, another interesting thing about vacuum forming was that VA clinics all over the country have vacuum forming machines. So while it's not the first thing you would necessarily think of for scaled production, it turns out that we could do hyperlocal production with vacuum forming in a way that we couldn't with almost any other technology and at high speed. So that was a technology we investigated significantly because of that um, feature of, of VA clinics. Um, but in any case, each of these has implications for model design. So with vacuum forming, there are directions that you can curve in and other directions that you really shouldn't if you want something to, to be successfully vacuum formed. And there you know, were issues with whether we could make square versus round holes and a whole variety of other things that were affected by the choice of that technology. Um, a final challenge for our design process was how to test, um, test things in the field, really. I would say fit was just part of that. So um, going back to the fit thing, though, you know, it took a long time to print these masks. We tried things like printing partial masks, but it turns out that it's just too unrealistic because people position it in ways that, that would, um, are not capturing uh, potential problems, say, with the nose, in this case, with Kelly. Um, and Although measurement is a, a, not a popular problem to study because it seems as though we have great tools for reconstructing 3D shape, it is a really huge issue in the field. We couldn't set things up in a reliable way at the speed we needed to in the hospitals we were testing in to capture measurements. And so we ended up playing around with um, various kinds of things that had known size and were easy to capture with a simple photo and then measure on top of in order to try to get a sense of face size. Um, and we needed to know face size because there's a lot of different face sizes. We had a lot of different mask designs and we needed to get a sense of how those mapped onto each other because eventually for N95 testing, for example, we need to show that a certain percentage of different face shapes are covered well by the masks that we produce. Um, I also want to point out that, you know, here's a bunch of different pictures of me wearing a bunch of different masks. Most of these don't fit me, but it's not immediately obvious from the picture that that is so. You know, this one at left um, with a, a different person wearing it that has the obvious bump over the nose with lots of room for air to flow. Yes, you can see that that doesn't fit, but it's not necessarily clear in these other spaces. Um, so we did a lot of work on trying to collect um, qualitative, reliable qualitative feedback about fit to face and thinking about, you know, we had to really talk to stakeholders to understand what really mattered here. Um, nose comfort turned out to be a big thing, but there's also have things that have to do with how many hours you wear them that we weren't going to get in our tests because people were only willing to put a short amount of time into them. And I should also mention that this is probably the most challenging user testing I've ever done. We spent a good three to four hours over multiple sessions practicing our user study in a lab because we needed to make sure that it was COVID safe. And here we have masks going on people's faces. Right, and we need to do it from a distance. We need to make sure everything's clean between every participant. We could not produce enough masks to throw them away after every test. Um, and we just had to go through a huge amount of testing. It was also really hard to recruit people and the students who stepped up to go into the hospital system and do the tests, you know, didn't know what risks they were taking at that time in the whole process. So it was a, it was a big deal to do these tests. Um, Okay, the next challenge I want to mention is design approval. So the main path for getting these approved is through the NIH 3D Print Exchange. Um, and this could get you what's called clinical approval. Um, so they had a rapid process in place. They intentionally brought down the barriers as much as possible. And we had an in with Beth, who had been interviewed in studies of ours in the past, is from Seattle and was closely tied to our innovation team and wanted to see our things make it through the system. Um, Overall, however, of everything that was submitted to the NIH, um, 500, over 500 um, items were submitted and 517 were never checked or there's no info about them. Um, only 34 were reviewed for clinical use and, and approved for clinical use. 28 were optimized for community use, meaning that you could give them to like restaurant workers or grocery store workers, but not to a hospital. And 32 actually got a warning as explicitly tagged as potentially unsafe. Among our designs, two were, approved, were actually reviewed and approved for clinical use. And as I mentioned, others never made it through the process even. Um, 
and there were several challenges here. Um, one big one was that they were just gummed up with many, many, many variants on designs. Nobody knew what variants were, were big enough to lead to a need for clinical reevaluation. And so even just looking at face shields, there's a number of designs that ended up being uploaded to the 3D print exchange and having to be evaluated because we don't have a good way to automatically assess whether a change is consequential or not, or how big a change it is. Um, Okay, the other approval process that you have to go through is NIOSH for the kind of PPE we were creating. And in particular, we can't deploy our N95 masks because they have to go through NIOSH approval and NIOSH never got around to making a fast track version of this. Um, in order to get the N95 masks approved, we need to do a fit test um, with at least 25 participants with face sizes falling into these different buckets um, and 50% much pat must pass. So that's not the barrier, we can do that. What's harder is we need to use a testing rig um, and we need a company, an, a for-profit company to get involved. There is no way for an academic unit or a team like ours to even enter the process without a company. So this is still in progress. Um, okay, challenge number four, how am I doing on time? I don't know where my clock is. I'm just gonna trust that we're okay. Um, challenge number four is design generality. Um, and so, what we need to do for design generality is um, make sure that things can um, be reused. And this came up most often in the, in the mask fit to face domain because there's so many different uses for that once you have it. Um, so it wasn't long before we switched from this design at top left, which really can only be used in one way with one kind of N95 filter to something that was modular which had the advantage that we could, for example, put different kinds of filters on it, or even, as I mentioned earlier, do something like a non-rebreather that was completely different from the original goal for that design. Um, of course, the tools that we had for developing this didn't specifically support this kind of modularity. Um, Here's an example of the non-rebreather, by the way, adaptation. You can see that in addition to changing what we put in the hole in the center of that design, we also added flaps here because it's okay to breathe out. The non-rebreather's importance has to do with what's coming in. Um, another issue with modularity, again, goes back to measurement because, um, it, for example, if we were attaching these tubes for some reason to this mask, the size of the, the diameter of those tubes is different. And at least there we're, we're going with round to round, but often it might be a square peg you have to fit, in, fit into your round hole, right? And so simply having tools that would make it easy to generate these kinds of connectors on the fly would allow a approval, say, for a, a mask that fits a face to go to be done once and then have that connected to many different devices. Um, that's not something that's easily supported by tools yet. The last thing I wanna mention as a challenge is longitudinal viability. This is not something that we studied in the COVID case, but what I'm showing here is actually the cello recital of a, a boy who has a limb difference. Um, he's wearing this device that you see on the left that's marked 2015. Um, he's actually wearing the exact same device. Um, we updated it um, within about three or four months with a slightly different connector for the bow holder. But what you're seeing in this 2020 image is actually what his mom had to do when he outgrew the original gauntlet. Um, she just molded this out of some kind of clay and put it back together. Um, we're trying to work with her to get her to measure his arms so that we can produce a new gauntlet for her. But the idea that, um, I mean, first of all, this is a success, right? It was used for five years straight by this boy. But secondly, again, the process itself doesn't naturally support these kinds of updates over time. And particularly when you think about the relationship that uh, develops between makers and recipients in groups like Enable, there's not necessarily support for this kind of back and forth over time. Okay, um, and I guess I'll just add to that, that we had stories from people where the, the turnover in the maker volunteers was just too high to support that. So it's not that those relationships couldn't be created, but there's a lot of barriers in terms of how to make that happen. So here's a summary of the five challenges I mentioned, quality control, design process, design approval, design generality, and longitudinal viability. What can we do to address these? Of course, being a technologist, that's where I wanna go next or first even. Um, and um, 
I do believe that there are places that we could do better. Um, so for example, we could think about increasing support for prototyping in the design process. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about some of the work we've done there. We could think about what a medical grade CAD tool would look like. How might you design a CAD tool that's meant to operate in clinical settings? Um, we could think about case management systems. Enable has deployed one and is starting to see some progress because of that, right? So how do these kinds of things fit in? I think there's a huge number of open problems here and I'm not gonna have time, nor do I have the results in this talk to tell you what the answer is to all of these. But if we're, going, if we're serious about 3D printing and other fabrication technologies, leaving the lab and the hobbyist space, we're gonna have to think about these kinds of things in order to make it to the next level. So I'm just gonna focus on the, the um, actually the top two here today. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit more about prototyping. So I showed this image of a paper cup um, but this isn't the first time we've seen low-end technologies be valuable in prototyping. So for the cello bow holder that I showed you, one of our very first iterations actually involved Lego. And the reason is that um, actually comes down to measurement, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. It's hard to know how long the gauntlet and the bow holder needed to be in order to support cello playing effectively for this young man. Um, and it turns out that the length of your arm affects how you lean and reach, it can affect back health, and it can affect the quality of your sound if you don't get it right. But there isn't something there that you can measure. So the ability to explore and to explore rapidly and iteratively faster than you can 3D print is really essential. And that's what we were expl ex um, exploring in this particular thing. Um, and here we just, you know, obviously we're just iterating because we didn't know how to solve the problem and we needed to try different design ideas. Um, Moving on to measurement, um, it turns out that measurement is really hard for everyday people. So um, June Kim um, helped lead a study on Mechanical Turk a few years ago where we asked people to measure known items at least two ways, just randomly, whoever signed up in Mechanical Turk. And people were really bad at it. It was, they were bad even if we hadn't asked them to do it twice with two different devices. Um, and these are just some examples of things that were hard. So sometimes it was the tool being used. And that's what you see here with this um, sewing ruler that is flexible. It has a bump in it, right? So that's going to affect accuracy potentially and badly enough that your iPhone would fall out of its case if you designed it using this measurement. Um, another issue is um, shown in the, the second two photos is that it's not always clear what to measure. So here um, we have a phone with a curved edge. Um, while it is clear what to measure here, you need to use some degree of skill to be able to figure out how to line up something that's not against the ruler and get the correct, correct measurement. In this other case, we're measuring the diameter of the bottom of this bulb, but because it is not a straight edge, it's not clear if you want the inner or the outer di di uh, diameter of these threads, right? Um, and so there's a bunch of knowledge that we might assume but not, not see in people who need to do measuring that's missing here. We also measured the angle of laptop screens, like what is the maximum angle your laptop can go back to. And people's knowledge of how to use a protractor or otherwise how to measure angle was just, just non-existent, right? I mean, <laughs> it just wasn't there. So there's a lot of issues with measuring um, and it comes up again and again. And every time I, I talk about it as a research problem, as I said, I get pushback from people who say, well, this is not a hard problem. And maybe it's like the Star Trek doors. It's that kind of thing that is really hard, but looks easy um, and therefore hard to, to focus on in research, but it is definitely not solved. Um, and it is critical to getting things out there, I think, into the world. Another thing that we'd like to see um, made more feasible is the use of multiple materials. Any of the COVID work that we did that required softness was um, a post hoc assembly process, right? And masks comfort over many hours on your face really would benefit from softness. Actually, it was a running joke in our group because the best fit to face was almost inevitably when, um, when uh, Jeff Lipton, who led the face mask work, would put a, a piece of um, plastic, he just took like two millimeter plastic and cut out you know, a breathing hole and then just used it as a skirt on various things. Um, and we had this running joke that he must have stocks in plastic because he brought it up so many times. And then the gowns came along and we actually had a use for it that the medical professionals would accept. Um, but really it made a huge difference in how comfortable and how closely things fit face when we put that there. 
the ability to, to take cloth or other soft materials and mix them in with hard materials is critical, I believe, for, for non-hobby deployable um, fabricated technologies. And I don't think it's solved yet. So although I'm showing some examples here of work that we've done to, um, with knitting machines and cloth and 3D printing, there's a lot left to do there. The next thing I want to talk about is medical grade CAD and what that might look like. Um, so um, the kinds of things that we need to be able to do in CAD in order to keep track of things like testing and clinical validity have to do with parameterization, modularity, requirement specification, and supporting all of that in ways that are familiar to um, people who are not necessarily uh, experts at doing this kind of work. And so, um, and I'm noticing it's 145, so I'm gonna try to go quickly through this piece so there's time for questions as well. Um, we have been doing a lot of work looking at what kinds of designs people are making now that are out in the real world. Um, and we focus on things on Thingiverse that have at least some real world object involved in them because that's starting to get us out of the hobby space just a little bit. And we see that things like bounding boxes um, or molding to shape or swept paths are examples of things that are done a lot in many different contexts. So in the parts project that Megan led, um, what we did was we developed a library of reusable parts so you could select something um, from the library, such as an adjustable cup holder. Um, and then it was pre-configured with the parameters that you might need. Um, and most importantly, it was also pre-configured with a set of modular things that represent not only the part, but also how it interacts with the world. So these see-through models represent a pipe um, and a cup in the context of a workshop where we asked people to make cup holders that could clamp onto their bicycle using a pipe clamp. Another thing that you can see here is that we had um, taking uh, learnings from our measurement work, we, we realized that if people are bad at measurement, we might want to address this in the model. In particular, if we make models that accommodate measurement error, then it's not as critical that measurements are perfect. And so in this case, the idea would be to print a ring of flexible material as well as a ring of hard material and join them together in order to accommodate measurement error in the size of a cup, for example. Um, when two parts are put together, if you have information about how they're expected to be used, you can start to do validation. And so here you can see on the left, the pipe that the pipe clamp is holding is intersecting the cup. Um, although neither of those are part of the actual model, it's critical to know that they intersect because it's not gonna work on your bike to put your cup in if it hits your handlebar. Um, and these, these expectations are things that can be specified in the tool and attached to these models that can then be imported and used. This was done in Fusion 360. So here's an example of a, um, a usable version of this cup holder. It's not pretty, but it's demonstrating what's doable in terms of using these kinds of assertions and other aspects of parts. Um, and when we ran a workshop with people who were either using Fusion 360 or parts, we saw that their ability to get all the, all the way to a functional print was much higher. Um, so the purple bars are our are, are tool parts and the yellow bars are the parts of the process that people were able to successfully achieve using Fusion 360. Um, now these were beginners with both tools and many people have told me in criticisms of this work that such facilities do exist in CAD tools today. But what we were trying to do was not necessarily invent something that didn't exist, but lower the bar to using it, right? I think of this work as a little bit like end user programming for CAD. What can we do to bring software engineering principles into CAD in a way that is supportive of people who are not as expert. That's what we were trying to accomplish. Um, another thing we might want to be able to let people do is, is specify requirements. So these, um, these models have some requirements built into them in, the, in a CAD sense, like the possibility for a pipe to go through a certain amount of space. Um, but there's a lot of things you might care about in requirements. And I'm going to actually shift over into the knitting space for a minute because that's where we're about to present this work at WIST and that's the space that I have an example of this in. Um, so the idea that, that we're exploring here is whether we can develop a pipeline for optimization that can let people um, 
choose tactics for improving a design and objectives, which are essentially requirements for what that design should do, and have that work in a general optimization pipeline. And we did that in the context of knitting. Um, and what we do is we let people um, select among a library of objectives. We haven't yet worked out how somebody might, using end user programming tools, specify those objectives. But those objectives tell us things like, this lampshade should be tighter around the top and the bottom, and it should be see-through in the middle and things like that. Um, and then tactics. Tactics are different kinds of knit stitches in this case that you could substitute for what's called plain knit or stockinette that would help achieve these goals. And then we use an optimization-based solution that um, can take a map that connects objectives and tactics. So you need to tell the system what tactics are likely to help you get closer to the objective, in other words. And the rest is automated. Um, and here's a picture of sort of the pattern also being broken up into pieces. So for this lampshade, what we eventually knit was a tube that had a tighter structure at the top and bottom and stripes along the sides. And so we actually specified different objectives and tactics for each of these four different kinds of pieces in the pattern. And, in the, and the result matched our goal. Um, so that's all I'm gonna say about those two things. Um, I just wanna highlight again that there's a lot of open challenges here. And I hope that um, lots of people will start working on them because I think there's a lot to do to get to the next level of fabrication work. Sorry, James, I didn't say much about create, but I covered lots of other ground today. Happy to take questions now. Thanks for the great talk, Jen. I wanted to ask about this like one sentence you mentioned really early on about the differences in community acceptance of like make for COVID that make for COVID achieved versus like the UW COVID like task force. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that and like why you saw the differences and like what caused those differences. Yeah, um, I don't think I have a, a great answer to that. Um, I will say that the UW Task Force was conceived and run by the UW Hospital um, system, the medical school, and um, they had a really clear goal at the beginning, which had to do with trying to make sure that they did not run out of PPE, right? I mean, that was the first goal. And, and you know, it's one of the bigger hospitals in the area, but it was also that was where it was safe to send things if they had been approved by our group. Um, and we had the in there and we knew what we were doing. Um, and we did run into some issues later when we wanted to distribute more broadly also with just concerns about liability and other things. I think that the center of mass of Make for COVID, although there were academics involved, was outside of the university and medical system. And so I think they had the freedom to do things differently the other thing that I think is really critical was that for better or for worse, um, they just had buy-in of the maker community in a way that we did not achieve. And I think we were a little bit late reaching out perhaps, um, but there were there ended up being parallel efforts in Seattle. And um, and so they just went in different directions, what, what the makers in Seattle were doing and what we were doing. And, but when we were ready to try to reconnect, it, it was, um, not, I don't think either group would have willingly handed the other the reins, and, and it wasn't clear how to collaborate without doing that. So I think good people trying to do good things in both places, but just really, really different outcomes. Good question. Yeah, uh, great talk, Jen. Thanks so much for sharing all of the things that you've been doing, and, and it's exciting to see. Um, kind of following up a little bit on the question, I think that um, the really interesting, one of the really interesting things you talked about was, you know, the, the socio-technical challenges of the community aspect, as well as like collaboration. I'm wondering if you can talk more about, you know, approaches that you've seen in terms of, uh, yeah, I guess different approaches to collaborative support for people working on innovation together. There's been a lot of work in that space in the past, in both in terms of like, um, yeah, it, you know, more from the ME, uh, you know, design and innovation side of things. But then I wonder now there's also this threat of community support tools emerging um, in CSCW. And do you feel like there are, yeah, uh, things that you think might help to sort of provide this community support or help manage that? Because it seems like that's a real challenge that you observed is the tension between clinicians and the people that want to help and how do you get everyone on the same page? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of different questions, I think, hidden in what you just raised. 
I'll start with just what we actually used, right? So we, we used Google Docs and we used Slack um, more than anything else and Zoom, right? Um, so those were really valuable. Um, one of the things that was surprising to me was that we, we are still seeing barriers of people's level of comfort with technology being an issue in some of the collaboration we're doing. So not everyone um, was equally comfortable with those tools and or even using them. And then on top of that, when we started to go out into the field, like to do tests in the hospital, getting Google Forms working properly, counting on network connectivity in the hospitals, being able to get people to upload photos they took off their phones, those all ended up being challenges. So for all of the like progress that we've made with tools, some fairly old challenges are still very much present in our efforts to work together. Um, we also needed to deal with differences in hardware. So shipping files around from site to site was okay, but not necessarily sufficient for making sure that we had things fully replicated. Um, and so, so those are some of the things that were challenges and, and the hardware piece, of course, being new in the 3D printing domain, perhaps, right? Or, or bringing back old things that haven't been a, an issue for a while. Um, in terms of how well tools build trust, I'm not sure it's tools. I think it's time and face-to-face -face communication that is still at the core of getting communities connected and building their trust and ability to connect with each other. Um, although there were also security issues. So like Make for COVID, for example, had a just a sign-in wall between you and their documentation because they just didn't want anyone coming up and looking at it, for example, right? Um, and we had... Um, some of those kinds of things also in the Seattle group. So, yeah, I, I guess I'm, I don't feel like I'm really answering your question because I don't think I know the answer, but I do think that being you know, like realistic about the fact that there's still age old challenges, and age old is unfair, computers haven't been around that long, but you know, <laughs> that some of those things are still there is, is important to acknowledge. Does that help at all? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Okay, good. And we have a question from a student who's in the seminar and submitted a question. Um, is wondering, they say, you know, you had to put in a lot of effort trying to redesign um, what are sold in as really well-established products like masks and face shield. And they were wondering whether it would be possible or how it would be possible to instead go work with industry to basically devote the, your resources instead of through this trial and error process to the actual sort of uh, creation of more of these things instead right. of starting from scratch? So that's a really good question. Um, so Adriana Schultz, for example, who's the, the graphics professor who was doing uh, leading the gown design effort, she ended up talking to REI at one point and other companies to the, about manufacturing. But the issue was that the um, the sourcing for these things wasn't working, right? So this maybe was a really unique thing to that moment in time, but there just wasn't, there weren't enough people who were able to produce the material to make N95 masks. There, the people who normally produce gowns were not being able to, were not successfully producing them and delivering them at the scale that was needed. And so the focus became on what we could do locally. Um, and that did include talking to companies, but if a company that didn't normally produce hospital gowns was suddenly re, revising what their faculty was producing, they needed models and guides. And so that was where what we were doing, for example, with the gown work. With the mask and 95 work, we were trying to figure out ways of reducing the amount of filter material that was needed so that you could cut up a mask if you had it and put it into that square holder that you saw, for example, or you could take that round holder had like a, um, a piece of material that's normally used in, I think, furnace systems or something, right, that was N95 quality. So could you take advantage of other manufacturing pathways and bring that into something that fit to face? So th that was what was driving that work, was this need to do sort of hyper-local production in the absence of a supply chain that was functioning properly. And one other question that we got is wondering what kinds of limitations you saw in digital platforms for sharing or collaborating on designs like Thingiverse, NIH 3D print and so on in the context of designing and sharing medical devices specifically. 
Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the NIH platform was working um, and it, it does let you upload some quality assurance related kinds of stuff like guides for how to use it properly and so on. Um, it wasn't a collaboration platform. And in fact, the more variants of things that were submitted, again, the more it kind of gummed up the whole approval process, as far as I could tell. Um, it was explicitly a choice um, in our group not to put this stuff on places like Thingiverse, but a lot of stuff did show up on Thingiverse and a lot of design variants came out of that. Um, so I do think that um, sharing ideas is possible on Thingiverse. In our interviews with makers in the past, um, who worked in the medical system, there was a lot of concern about sharing models for things that might put them in a situation where they had liability. So it was okay to share within their institution, similar to sort of what we had in the Seattle domain, but not necessarily outside the institution. What was more, people were more interested in sharing was learning um, outside the institution. And I think that if we had better tools for being able to describe what was a use of something that stayed within the clinically valid um, range for parameters of that thing, it might be more feasible to share things more widely. Um, so Megan talks a lot to me about clinical CAD and what that might look like and whether we could do that, um, support that kind of sharing. But at least for things that have health and safety risks, it's a very fine line what can be shared and what can't, I think, broadly speaking. Well, we have Another one, I'll ask one final one. Um, does, I guess in your experience, was there a tension between makers and clinicians in the development of this kind of technology? Or is it any better or worse than it would be in other situations? Um, within our group in Seattle, I don't think there was tension. Um, there was eagerness to work together. It was actually, for me personally, I don't think I've ever been part of such a large group of faculty who are mostly doing their own work. Students, usually you do the work for us, right? <laughs> um, it, was, it was a really interesting experience. And um, there was a ton of back and forth work of like, how do we do this? The level of support for getting things into the hospital to do the testing was super high. Um, people were really eager to bring ideas to the team. We met weekly as a, a group um, to discuss what new needs were developing that we might be able to address. And you know, some things ended up being failures. So I didn't really talk about it, but there was something that came out of China, I think that was like a, um, a box that you could put over somebody's face and then stick your hands underneath the box so your face was above it, like plexiglass for protection and like intubate, for example. And it turned out eventually that COVID was so airborne that this was not actually a safe solution for anything. And, but we got quite far with, um, taking the initial design, which was already very good, and testing it and modifying it, and then we just dropped it when it wasn't safe anymore. Nobody was upset about that because the makers trusted the clinicians about safety as much as the clinicians trusted the makers about how do we do this, right? Um, and it was really, you know, everyone stepping up. I mean, at one point we had a material science uh, question and a faculty member that I knew in material science spent, you know, much of his evening and late into the night doing the research necessary to help answer that question, even though he wasn't even part of the team. And I think that was all he did for most of the time that we were doing this work, but it was crucial when it happened, right? And so it was also just this moment in time when everyone was like, let's work together, let's make things happen. It was pretty cool to be part of.